Hvala Isus i Marija, draga braćo i sestre. Evo, velika mi je čast što vam mogu predstaviti našeg današnjeg gosta, Marina Restrepa, kolumbijskog katoličkog propovjednika koji je svijet obišao na vještajuće evanđelje i govoreći o svome obraćenju. Pa evo, da ne dužimo previše, možemo početi sa našim današnjim intervjuom. Marino, Mr. Restrepo, hi. Hi. I'm really honored to welcome you here in Zagreb in this beautiful chapel and where we are. Um, and I'm really honored that you are here in Croatia so often. So uh, I believe you have a special bond with, uh, with us, our, our people. Uh, for the start of the interview, um, maybe we could start with the newest and freshest information uh, and the circ- circumstances uh, that are around us. And that is the uh, COVID-19 crisis that hit the world. And, um, uh, We as Christians and Catholics are called to look on the situation in the world from the higher perspective, not just from the bottom part and uh, getting quarrels and uh, start dividing ourselves, uh, especially inside the church, but we are called to take a higher perspective and look why God is uh, allowing something like this to happen. So can you give us your opinion and your view on uh, the current situation in the world and the crisis that hit us. Yes, first I'd like to thank you for the invitation and and you are right, I have a, a very special bond with Croatia, with the Croatian people, especially the Catholics of Croatia. And so it's great to be back. And I, I couldn't come back last year for because of the pandemia, but I'm glad I'm back. We have visited up Uh, 21 cities so far in this uh, mission. So, yes, um, I guess the whole world in, is really concerned about this pandemia because uh, it's unpredictable. And uh, uh, we know that science has its limits, right? Science is limited and it is basically experimental until it's proven that it's successful in any given discovery. So we depend of, of science as far as our natural life. But we have to remember that nothing moves without God. And like you said, Catholics are called to rise above Uh, what is natural, because when something so difficult takes place, like a war, and you guys know about wars, you know, a war a, or a pandemic like this, or a natural disaster, a, one has to go over the nature and get into God. And this is the time for that. Um, the first thing we should ask ourselves is uh, why God allowed this? And it's an important question for every person because we don't want a universal answer. We want a personal answer because God is obviously talking to each one of us by allowing this. And my perspective is that God is not happy with uh, the world. And obviously the world has never been good. Uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches us that the world is one of our enemies. Um, so I don't think God is upset with the world because he knows the world. And He, Jesus told us that the prince of this world is Satan. So, But God is upset with his people that are worldly because we are not to become worldly. We're supposed to be the people of God that has to bring God to people. And I think particularly uh, to us Catholics, God is really ringing the bell. Uh, we can see how close churches were closed for a long time worldwide. And many Catholics were really upset with bishops and the Pope and everybody because they said it was a conspiracy. And I was always thinking, God will not let a conspiracy close down the church, you know. It's his church. So God allowed that to happen. 
And it's very curious that now that the churches are open, many Catholics didn't come back. They're still watching masses virtually at home. So God was sweeping the church. <laughs> God was cleaning. His, cleaning the his, church. And uh, <coughs> during this pandemic, you, you started talking about the church, so we can open this, this topic. Uh, inside the church, there are many divisions especially regarding this situation uh, of COVID. And uh, you told us about uh, closing the church worldwide and uh, people were watching uh, Easter Mass from, uh, from their homes and there was no uh, possibility to go for a confession for this, uh, this greatest holiday that we, that we celebrate in the Catholic Church. And uh, do you think that uh, God allowed this because uh, we as Catholics maybe lost faith in supernatural power that is inside the Eucharist and inside the Holy Mass. It is reasonable to, to close it because of the COVID and the wide infections, but mm -hmm. did we lose this touch with the God's uh, power that is uh, supernatural, that is higher than what we can imagine? Yes, I believe that we lost the grace because we are not good enough, you know. Um, and, the, and the evidence is how many people didn't return. It shows you that a lot of Catholics were in the church, but they were not for the church. They were for themselves in the church. And then they kept themselves very comfortably in the living room at home, watching masses, right? And they are not concerned about the sacraments really, because that's why they didn't come back. So that's why God was uh, calling our attention, ringing the bell, you know. And I think uh, God is talking to us, you know, through that. And we don't know this, uh, how long it's going to go, because this could go on for until God humbles us. <laughs> yes, until God decides to stop it. Yes. Yes, yes. And... Uh... There is one topic that arised year after the first lockdown, and that's the vaccination. And uh, Pope uh, recently, like a week ago, uh, posted a video that uh, called us for a vaccination and told that is the act of love. Uh, what do you think about that? Because a lot of people uh, attacked Holy Father because of that opinion, and they believe that vaccination is also a conspiracy, like, uh, like many things? Uh, well, uh, I, I guess about seven months ago, Pope Francis and Pope Benedict XVI both of them got the vaccine, right? And uh, um, then the social doctrine of the church issued a document explaining the vaccines and explaining the moral factors around the vaccine, and also explaining the circumstances, the pandemic and, and all of these circumstances. Now, we have another factor involved here, and it is um, the prophet Isaiah um, in, chapter, in, in chapter 8 uh, from 11 on, it speaks about conspiracies, right? And God is telling the prophet about his people and the conspiracies. Conspiracies are spirits, you know, of division. That's what they are. Because we as Catholics, we can have a healthy conversation about vaccines and about the circumstances of the pandemic. And we can sit and talk about that without being divided and without hating each other or without thinking the one that doesn't think like me belongs to Satan, right? Uh, to do a Christian uh, take of this situation, we need to be coherent, prudent, and we need to be uh, loving and charitable, compassionate. So I think that at this moment, Something really bad and dark uh, with the vaccines began in the United States. And it began with Trump and for political reasons only. And uh, 
there were many sects like QAnon and the Brotherhood and some others that build themselves around to with white supremacists to support this president. And uh, then uh, the president, at a given moment when the pandemic started, he denied the pandemic and said that it was just nothing. And, and he said, vaccines are not necessary. It's, that's from the devil. That, and then all kinds of millions of conspiracies began coming out uh, with no foundation at first, right? And then scientists got involved uh, and became very popular in the social media. You know, it's like everybody takes the chance to become a YouTuber, and an influencer when something big happens and, and he has the potential of many followers. So, so many doctors became famous, many scientists became famous and people giving all kinds of uh, ideas about the, the vaccines. And um, obviously, we need to know that for every disease in the world that is a potential pandemia like Ebola in Africa, right? Ebola in Africa was a serious disease. I have been in Africa a few times during the times of the Ebola that was surging and people were really afraid. And, and uh, science, scientists from like seven countries got together and came up with a vaccine to stop it, right? And they successfully did it in a very short time, a spectacular short time, and they stopped it, you know? And so once in a while it comes back, and, but they have the vaccine, you know? So um, I think that here what is happening now is that politics are involved with pandemia, economics, and also really real bad people, you know, people that have an agenda, special agenda. And so I don't take sides, you know, I'm not pro-vaccine or against vaccine. That's not something I do. I don't do that because it doesn't make any sense, you know. You have to have a personal responsibility with your health, a personal responsibility with your country, your community, the people you live with, you know, your family, that's personal. You have to be conscious about, and you have to take a decision, what are you gonna do? And also you have a responsibility as to who you read, who you believe, who you follow, all of that, you know? I am a Catholic missionary, as you know, and uh, I follow the church. I belong to the church. And I think that Pope Francis and Pope Benedict XVI, to me, are two very wise old men. And also I believe that the Holy Spirit does uh, manifest through them. Uh, obviously, the recommendations of Pope Francis are not a law. He's just recommending it. And, but people that are against the Pope, they take it as if the Pope told everyone, you have to vaccinate because that's what enemies do, right? But I think he's just counseling people to do what, it, what he thinks is convenient, right, for people. Now, the moral issues about tissue and aborted babies and all of that, this is something that has to be taken from the social doctrine of the church. They have a document issue, and everybody can read it. It's in vatican.va. Uh, and you can read it, and I think it's a very good document, you know, and then you take your decision, your personal decision. And that's what I think. But all this conversation of conspiracies, I think is poisoning. And uh, I recommend people that are going to be watching us to read uh, Isaiah 8 from 11 on, but from a Bible that is Catholic, not from a Protestant Bible, or a watered-down Bible, which are those Bibles that are, they say, accessible to everyone. Those are not good Bibles, because they are changed, you know, by Protestants. So you, you have to have the Jerusalem Bible or the uh, Navarra Bible from Spain or the Bible from the uh, Episcop Episcopal Conference of Philippine Bishops. That's a very good Bible, you know. And uh, so you can see the language 
because God used the, the word conspiracy. And there has been, through the history, sacred history, uh, demons of conspiracy, always. So the demons are doing what they do. They do division That's among, right. among the people. Yes. So uh, you basically said that it's our personal decision whether we are taking the vaccine or not, and yes. that we do the personal research among the yes. uh, viable uh, sources and uh, we make our own decision. That's correct. Did you take the vaccine? Yes, I yes. did, so, yes. So you had vaccine. I have a, a medical condition that is delicate. I have an open heart surgery, high blood pressure, diabetes. Uh, so I, if I get COVID, I get killed, you know, <laughs> I die. And uh, also I have a community, many people around me that I can hurt if I don't be careful about the, the pandemia. And I come from a, a continent, America, that has been badly hit by pandemia. Because like in Croatia, you haven't been beaten by pandemia. People are really free here regarding that. But in America and the whole continent, from Alaska to Patagonia, uh, people have been hit badly. We know at least I and my community, we know at least a hundred people that die around us. You know, so that's a big evidence, you know, and we've seen people die. We, we have helped people take into the hospital with oxygen tanks and die two days later and things, many, many, you know. So we've seen the pandemia personally. <laughs> and uh, I think that's the position where the Pope is because uh, he sees a position from the whole world. Yes. And we as a church from the nation, we see our nation. That's correct. And uh, I think uh, regarding the Pope's uh, uh, video about uh, the vaccine, uh, five bishops supported him. All of them were from Latin or uh, North America. So I think uh, parts of the world got hit really bad and Pope has to take uh, his side and do what's wise. Um, but let's move from the COVID part and uh, look, the church that is right now, uh, even before the COVID, it was really divided. Uh, many bishops and many, uh, many priests and many lay people, believers, uh, started uh, accusing the church, especially the Pope, about the way uh, he works, about uh, his words and uh, about his, some of his actions. Um, uh, what's your comment and what's your view on uh, on today's situation and today's uh, uh, condition that are in the church? Well, I think the church has always been in turmoil because it's the church of God. We know that when a priest falls into disgrace, like a pedophile or any scandal, it will be published in all papers around the world. If a Protestant pastor, a, a a Muslim mullah or a Jewish rabbi commit a crime, nobody buys the news, you know, nobody cares. So it shows you that our church is the church of God and therefore is always attack and is in turmoil inside because we have the Judas Iscariot spirit in the church and that's why Judas was left until the last supper, right? Because Jesus was teaching us human nature will be in the church until I return. There's no way out. We are humans, right? Imperfect people. So, okay, so now today we have difficult situations like Germany, you know, the German church and the Episcopal Conference of Germany uh, taking steps that are not, not Catholic and not caring about because it's a very rich church. They have lots of money and they could be independent, you know. And also people ignorantly think that the Pope can just fire the bishops, you know. And uh, they don't know that every country is a region of the church and they are independent. They, they are in obedience to the Pope, but they have their own laws, canonic laws that protect them. And they can take local decisions. And for the Vatican to be involved with that, they have to go through many canonic laws to get to stop something or to change something. 
and, and people don't know how difficult that is. It's, uh, same thing is happening with Switzerland for many years and nobody talks about it. And it, Switzerland is worse than Germany, what is happening in Switzerland with the Catholic Church. And the Vatican has been trying since John Paul II, since Benedict XVI, now with Pope Francis, trying to work with Switzerland and trying to get them to come to the center. They are in the extreme left, you know, and they are pro practically Protestantized, you know. So Pope Francis uh, has had uh, many conflicts with the way he addresses himself regarding social doctrine and creates a lot of confusion because he has a way of expressing himself that comes from his formation, his education, his priesthood, right? Uh, but there is something that people don't look at, but I do. And it is the foundation of our faith uh, is the deposit of faith, you know? When a, a pope messes with dogma and uh, touches the, 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 the deposit of faith, then that pope is already entering a, 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 a dark territory. This pope has never touched anything of the foundation of our faith, has only touched on social doctrine. And that's why many people are scandalized with his social doctrine, you know. Yeah. And do you think that his social doctrine uh, has a root from uh, where, he is, where he comes from? He comes from Latin America, in, in, in Argentina. It's a lot different situation than it is in Italy or Germany or Switzerland. Yes, uh, I guess it has to do with first, he had to deal with the theology of liberation of many of the Argentinian priests and Brazilian priests because he was there as, as a cardinal and archbishop uh, when all of this became really a boiling pot, you know, and it was difficult, like I said, a, a, an archbishop doesn't have the power to go and, and chase every parish priest and tell him not to preach theology or liberation. He has to come to an understanding, right? So he deals with those people by the enemies of the Pope say he was theology or liberation when there is evidence that he was never attached to that. Even the Jesuits have persecuted him. They, they sent him to exile in Germany, took him out of Argentina because he was not following the Jesuit rules in Argentina, right? So, but yes, all of that has influenced his social doctrine. Also, we see uh, Pius X was a pope that created waves like Pope Francis because he came up with a new social doctrine that was not something any pope would have done and was a lot of confusion at that time. And it reminds me of Pope Francis, you know. So I think that, yes, culturally, his influence, his own community, Jesuits, they have views that are completely different. I don't agree with them. You know, a lot of them are pre-Oriental, you know, like uh, from pa pagans, Orientalism, like Anthony de Mello, Pierre Tellard de Chardin, they were all contaminated with uh, many things that are not good, you know. And then the theology of liberation and many things. So I guess the Pope has an education, a formation, and an influence that brings about a different social doctrine. And that creates lots of problems with a lot of people. They don't understand him fully. No, but what they don't see is the good part of him. The good part of him is that he never touches dogma. He never touches the foundation of our faith. As a matter of fact, he has been one of the popes that has more spoken about hell, Satan, sin, you know, the Novissimus. Many popes haven't even mentioned it, you know, and he mentions it almost in every public audience, you know. And uh, so I guess a pope that is no good pope will never mention Satan as an enemy, you know. <clears throat> he mentions him a lot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes, and, yes. Uh, <clears throat> so to, you mentioned two examples of two countries. 
Germany and Switzerland. And uh, you said they went far left uh, in their Episcopal conferences. Yeah. So, uh, to be more specific with the question, uh, how much do you think that uh, uh, Freemasonry and uh, liberalism uh, influenced uh, Catholic cler cler clergy? And uh, in uh, what effect uh, does it have now on the situations in some of the countries that we mentioned and uh, some that are really close to them? I think that money has a lot to do with this. The, the German church is very wealthy and the uh, high hierarchy at the level of uh, cardinals and uh, archbishops, they are the ones that manage the money and they are in communion with the stock market, the German stock market, in communion with lawyers that manage money, economists, and the world a picture of the economy, right? So I guess they are pretty worldly in that sense, you know, and that brings about friendships with Masons, friendships with people that are worldly, materialistic, and only focus on on material things, on the world, you know, and that influenced them badly. Because then those people, the language they have socially is they accept LGTV as something normal, they accept uh, abortion as something normal, they accept all of that because it's the agenda of a worldly people, right? So they end up being worldly. And last time you were here uh, in Zagreb and I listened to you and you were talking a lot, lot about the spirit of materialism. Uh, and you travel all, all around the world. And where do you see that uh, the church and the faith is rising among the people? And where do you see that this uh, uh, worldliness uh, is uh, uh, crushing down uh, the faith and the people in the church? Um, as I began traveling the world, early in 1999 and 2000, <clears throat> I was very uh, upset and sad to see what was happening in many countries, right? But then after a while, I noticed that the globalization of this world was only turning people into consumism and materialism. And it was unavoidable because it was the industrialization, the technology, and the science, and the speed, you know, the, the speed in which everything is happening. And uh, so I saw the danger for the whole church all around the world. Uh, it was prominent uh, in the beginning in the first world, as we know it, right? Western Europe, North America, Japan, places like that, were prominently going really cold, the Catholics very materialistic and worldly. And, but they were covered up by economical factors, like uh, the North American church is a very worldly church, but it's a very charitable church. So they support poor people all around the world. They have great, job, great deeds. And that's confusing for people that are not, don't have the depth, you know, they see only the aus outskirts. Um, but I think it began with the first world, the church went down, became empty of God, and then it continued on. Latin America is turning like that. Clergy is turning more and more worldly. Uh, religious communities are breaking down. And uh, <clears throat> so this is happening all around the world now. Yeah. And as you mentioned, Latin America, there are uh, two types of stories that uh, come to us in Croatia. And uh, the first uh, wave that we can see is the uh, uprising of the faith, the revival in the Catholic Church. And the other one is uh, uh, uprising in the Pentecostal uh, Church in Protestants. And uh, what's your view on that? And uh, how do you, where do you see the roots of the division and up uprising in both views? Okay, there, there are many phenomena in relationship with Christianity in Latin America. The first one was the battle between the U.S. and Cuba, which was the battle between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, right? So because of that, Americans began spreading 
protestantism through Latin America because they thought the Catholic Church was becoming communist. <clears throat> so they sent all these evangelical, Pentecostal, Jehovah Witnesses, all these sects and cults, and gave them lots of money to build churches, to buy poor people, to, to give them education and health and all of that. It was a, a strategy of the Americans to defend the continent from communism. Right? So they protestantized Latin America on purpose and took with them millions of Catholics, you know, because it was a campaign done with millions of dollars through the CIA. <clears throat> okay, so now when the Soviet communism fell and it was left only Cuba with no money, still they had this poison of communism going on. And um, so now we have a phenomenon. We have um, like, I don't know, 10% of Latin America became Protestant, even probably more. In some countries like Central America is higher. In Brazil also is higher. And the rest is not that high, but it still is prominent. And then now we have a new problem. Communism is back in a big way, you know? So we have like Mexico, Nicaragua, Cuba, Venezuela, Bolivia, Argentina, and Peru, communists. There's many countries. And they're trying to get the rest. It's a conspiracy <clears throat> that comes out of Cuba. And so religion has become a balance and a way to hold on, you know, to, to the faith and stop the ideologies, these ideologies of communism, which are the ones that adopted LGTB, adopted abortion, adopted, so they look good for the youth. <clears throat> because most of the youth is brainwashed by these ideologies. And they think it's the way to go. They think, because they see Western Europe is preaching that. North America is preaching that. So they see communism preaching the same. So they say, well, these guys are the same, and they go with them. <laughs> you know, so it's such an incredible uh, seduction, and it's such a, a mischievous act of the devil, you know, how he works. So that is the character of the situation. From the outskirts and the news that you get, you only see this factor of the Catholic Church and the Pentecostals and Evangelicals, but you notice how much more there is, you know? <clears throat> yes. Uh, they are much more oppressed than we can see, and they, they hold on to the faith. Yes. yes, yes. And uh, you mentioned the two ways that are very similar. So the first is the Western European and North American liberalism and uh, the communism uh, that is spreading in Latin America. And uh, as you said, there is no much, there is not uh, so big difference in the ways, uh, in the things that they preach and the things that they do. Uh, how do you comment on that, that uh, they seem like they are fighting each other, but they do the same, same thing? Yes, it's an ama amazing absurdity, you know, because, um, okay, when we had the Cold War, then capitalism was supposed to be the good guys, you know, and the, the Soviet communism was the devil. Then Soviet communism collapses, and then we see all Western Europe and the U.S. take all the ideologies of the Soviet communism. You know, they were the ones that came up with all kinds of decadence and accepting all kinds of vices and abortion was a flag, everything was like that. And then the next thing you know, all Western Europe, all North America is taking the same road, you know. So you can see some people think the Berlin Wall fell down. I don't think it ever was, you know. I think what happened was that Soviet communism already took the world, you know, and didn't need a wall. See, it was done, the job was done. People were poisoned, you know, and the world was poisoned. And all these people that thought they were the good ones, they were poisoned too. And now they use it for business, you know. So if it works for the politics, 
they use it. They use LGTB, they use everything for them on their behalf, right? And so communists do the same. They use the same. And so it is a competition to see who gets the cake first, right? They fighting for power, for territories, but they have the same ideologies. Same ideology and the same spirit. Yeah. There's no much difference today between anybody. They just go and they have to adopt all these groups, you know? The, the gays and the lesbians and all these transgender people, <laughs> your trans species, we have crazy things today. So they adopt everybody and that's the way they go. Many Catholics, look at this president in the U.S. today, Biden, is a pro-abortion Catholic. Total contradiction. I mean, he's not a Catholic, really. He's <clears throat> pro-abortion. But he calls himself a Catholic. He goes to Mass every Sunday. So it's pretty deceiving. And unfortunately, a lot of people uh, fell under, under this trap that uh, the world has set up. But uh, I would now want, want to come uh, to a brighter side, to the light. Uh, as we were preparing for the interview, you said that you've been in Medjugorje before yes. coming to Croatia and that you are going there uh, again. And uh, you were there on the Youth Fest. And yes. Even though it was Corona, it was COVID time, uh, tens of thousands of youth gathered there and celebrated the Holy Masses, uh, were there on the Eucharistic Adoration and uh, really uh, gave another picture of the world. And uh, how do you see the role of Medjugorje and everything that is happening there uh, in the future of the church? I think Medjugorje is a big lesson for a lot of skepticals, you know, that uh, persecute Medjugorje for so many years, including clergy. Um, uh, I think uh, since I came to Medjugorje the first time in 2003, um, I was in a mission in Poland and I had no idea about Medjugorje. I was also new in the church. I, had, I was only four years a missionary. and. Uh, so I came to Medjugorje in 2003, and I had an amazing experience of peace. See, I felt the peace I never felt anywhere. And I didn't see any visionaries or nothing. I wasn't even interested in that. I just went there, went to the Cruzebeck, and then to Aparicion Hill, and then participated of the evening activities and all of that, three days, and left. But in my heart, an amazing peace was left. And uh, I didn't make any research about, didn't even take a book with the story. I just left and continued my mission through Europe. And I continued traveling the world. But every time I came back to Europe after that, I will go to Medjugorje, right? <laughs> yes. Because to me, it was a spot of peace. So It left the mark. Yeah, it began with peace. And um, little by little, I got into the story and I realized is the charisma of peace is Our Lady, Queen of Peace. And I was a witness of that because I had peace in my heart and I felt that great peace in Medjugorje. So I think that God uh, has done through Medjugorje what people need for today's times, which is like this great peace that brings you into an illumination of your conscience. Because this is what happens to thousands of people there that testified to that, that they had this clarity about sin, about their lives, about their past, and they have, co they have come to peace with God by coming to pilgrimage in Medjugorje, right? Uh, so I believe Medjugorje is a leading force, uh, and I think the Vatican is discovering that too. It was great. This manifest, you know, the youth festival that just passed, it was amazing to see Cardinal Sara there. Cardinal Sara is probably one of the most solid Catholics we have, you know? You couldn't be more structured and more integrated and more, uh, I mean, he is the greatest representation of what the real clergy should be as a Catholic, Cardinal Sara. He's been a candidate for papacy, twice, you know, in the two last elections. He was one of the candidates. So he's a man of heavyweight. And he came to Medjugorje for one day because he was invited to speak in the opening. He stayed, I, I think, the whole week. Really? Yeah. 
He fell totally in love. <laughs> and he was back and forth, going and giving catechesis, and he couldn't have enough for Medjugorje. So I think that Medjugorje has been a big surprise, even for Pope Francis. Pope Francis this year sent a letter of four pages of a greeting to the youth. And uh, that shows you that things are moving towards Medjugorje, changing, and I'm very happy about it. And I think Medjugorje is a very important place. I don't get confused with the visionaries, you know, because visionaries are human beings, and whatever they do, whatever they are up to, that doesn't change Medjugorje in any ways, you know. So I think I am at peace with Medjugorje, and I think that Medjugorje is a very important spot. Yes. Um, I share the same opinion as you. And uh, uh, this year, uh, it was the 40th anniversary of the first apparition. And uh, we were uh, happy enough and uh, to, uh, blessed enough to be there on the 40th occasion. And uh, a lot of people expected something to happen. And uh, the message that the, Our Lady gave was really, really beautiful and really for, for this time, as I felt. But uh, a lot of people expect something to happen in this or in the years that surround this 40th anniversary because the number 40 has a big meaning in biblical way. And do you think that uh, the future of the world will be shaped uh, in this two or three years, and uh, you already said that the Medjugorje has a big role in, uh, in, in what the church offers to the world now because of the peace and everything that's happening there. Yeah, I think that Medjugorje has been chosen to be a spot of strength and a spot of light for the world, a spot of faith, because it's totally Christ-centered. It's like a, a presentation of what a pilgrimage means. And we are all pilgrims in this world. We are in transit. And when we see a place like Medjugorje for pilgrims, we understand what pilgrimage with God means. You know, so I think, yes, Medjugorje is chosen by the Almighty Father to be a spot of light. And uh, many more people, uh, after all the millions that already have been there, many will still go through Medjugorje and receive these great blessings. Yes, and uh, Our Lady in Medjugorje said that if she will, uh, in Medjugorje, she will end what she started in Fatima. Um, how do you think that will affect uh, uh, the people of today in a larger scale? Not only those who come to Medjugorje, but uh, with everything that is to come, with expectations that the secrets are going to be revealed. What do you think will uh, happen uh, in in next period that is uh, in front of us? Uh, I heard that the secrets will be revealed before the missionaries die, right? And uh, they are young, but still nobody knows how many years anyone is going to live, right? Uh, so we could say that it is not too far for those secrets to be, you know, reveal, uh, but to say how long it is, is impossible, right? We don't know, but uh, it looks close, you know, because they are, they are not old, but they are not that young either, right? So, so you're talking about, let's say in the next 20 years, that's very close anyway, you know? So I will say that it's coming around sometime soon. Uh, obviously, the, uh, when Jesus ascended to heaven, he promised he would come back. And um, all the people that were around, say, they said the day of his ascension, there were like 500 people there. So many people saw what happened. And after that, for a few centuries, they were all saying, Jesus is coming back now, right? Even St. Paul was saying that, and the apostles. So... Obviously, when there is an announcement uh, that is spiritual and is supernatural, people always expect that to happen anytime. And it's about natural that that happened. So people are waiting for the secrets today, you know. 
and they think it's tomorrow, and that's the, the way they feel. And it's just a seal for what God has been giving to us, and it's holy, you know, it's not superstitious, I think it's healthy that you expect that to happen now, why not? But we don't know when, because God is the one that decides, yes. right? And it keeps us awake. Yeah. 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 I yes. Think, I and think it keeps it. us waiting for something great. Yes. Yes. Uh, so you believe everything will be great that comes out from Medjugorje? Well, I guess there are there must be some secrets that are difficult, and 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 it has to be with uh, the way the world is going and what is going to happen to people that are not with God, what is going to happen with nature and all of that. That's probably the part of the secret that we will not be very happy about it. But we also will not be very impressed because we know it's true and we sort of expect that to happen. And uh, we talked about one light that, uh, that is in the world, that is Medjugorje. And the other uh, that I would like uh, to talk with you about is the small community, small group of, uh, of believers and that are closely connected, that are in the fellowship among the other. And uh, in, there is like a trend or a thing that is, especially in uh, Western Europe and the Western world, that is coming now in, uh, in the Eastern parts of the world where the faith is still not that uh, attacked. And they are uh, forming communities and they are going on the outskirts of the major towns and building their own communities. And there is a book about this phenomenon that is going on. It's from uh, American author Rod Dreher. And it's, uh, the uh, name of the book is Benedict's Option. Did you heard about that? No. no. Are they Catholics? Uh, yeah, uh, from all the no denominations. Uh, the uh, author is the Orthodox. And uh, there are Catholic uh, communities like that, but also Protestant uh, and Orthodox communities. Uh -huh. Well, I know of Protestant communities for many years already that are uh, in, uh, in retreats, so to say. They are outside civilization and they have their own communities that are self-contained. They've been doing that, a lot of them, you know, evangelicals, uh, some Seventh-day Adventists and some others. And Catholics have been doing this lately uh, in the last... 30 years or so, I ran into big communities in Canada and the U.S. of Catholics. You know, Ave Maria is one of the examples. You know about Ave Maria in Florida? No, I haven't. Well, the guy that, that built uh, Domino's Pizza, yes. he uh, retired and sold the company for billions of dollars, and he went and built a Catholic city in Florida. It's called Ave Maria, and it's only Catholic, and it's a city, right? So, and they, are, they have done a few more in the U.S. And so there are many refuges, as they call them, around, and they are growing, getting more there. And I think the Catholics are going to look for communities in the future to educate the children, to, because the world is not going to be compatible with Christianity. And then no Catholic family we like to raise the children in, in the schools that the world has to offer with their ideologies and craziness. So communities are going to become very popular. So you think it's a good way to, uh, to think about like a strategic retreat to conserve it, uh, what is good in society and right values to be uh, put in children? I think it's good as long as it's coherent and prudent and it's not fanatical. As long as you don't become like exclusive in a way that you think the rest of the world is evil and you are good, because then that is a mistake. And that's the mistake many uh, sects have come made. Yes, we, we as Catholics and Christians have to be open for evangelization and for the, for the that's others. That's right. We cannot mm. hide and abandon the war, you know, because yes. God sent us to uh, take his message to everyone. Yeah. <clears throat> so. You mentioned uh, raising children uh, and uh, the danger that is now in the Western world and coming in Croatia with uh, all this uh, crazy ideology that is taking place in the schools. Um, 
what would be your advice for uh, for the young uh, parents uh, what to do and how to raise the children in, in this time well i mean in Croatia, you still have Catholic uh, education. Some areas of Croatia still have the privilege of having Catholic schools, you know. So as long as you have that, you do that, right? But I think uh, one of the prominent um, decisions around the world for Catholics avoiding contamination from these ideologies is homeschooling, right? And governments are establishing that legally everywhere where parents can educate their children. And I think that is one of the most practical solutions nowadays, you know. Elementary and secondary school done at home and associated with all the homeschooling parents, right? They become a community that meet once in a while to get, gives a social life to the children, right? So I think that is the formula for today, you know, so far. Okay, so that's the first part that's uh, where to uh, get the formal education for the children. And uh, do you have children? Uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, are they in faith now? Right? No, I have two sons. Uh, they were born in Germany, grew up in California. Uh, my oldest son is 48 and the younger one is 46 and I have two grandchildren. But they grew up with me without the faith. Yes, uh, I, I, I remember that. And, oh, okay. uh, um, what would you do differently that, uh, if, you'd, uh, if you were uh, converted back then? And uh, how would you, what, what would be the difference between you then and you now as a father? I would have in, I would have raised them with the faith and would have taken to church always. Would have made sure that they were educated and formed in the Catholic faith, and that's what I would have done. I see so many good Catholic families, and I could have been one of them. Yes. Okay, and. Uh... Uh, for the end, uh, we talked about many parts of the world, many countries, and uh, there are still some of the countries that uh, have strong uh, Christian leaders and uh, that are conserving and fighting for uh, Christian uh, uh, Christian values and uh, and the rights of the Christian to 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 preserve and fighting against the LGBT and all these other uh, ideologies that are coming. But uh, very few of them are Catholics. Uh, why do you think that Catholics uh, um, sort of have a, like some uh, fear from uh, becoming politically active and uh, fighting for the, uh, in, in, in this, this political arena for Christian and Catholic values and uh, the Protestants uh, don't have that much fear than, that, that, we, uh, that we have? We have a phenomenon in our Catholicism, and it's clericalism. We uh, suffered of clericalism for too long, too many centuries. And laity was just the, the hurt, obeying and following, you know, with no leadership in the church whatsoever. Only lately, especially since the 50s, 60s, uh, a new herd of Catholics came out communities and lay people taking the lead um, that has changed the face of the church, but not enough. And, and that's why our church is very shy. Yeah. Because uh, the world will not like to listen to clergy about politics. Uh, and as a matter of fact, they cannot participate in politics. And society will not accept them anyways. But the laity, that are the ones that are supposed to go out there and also be active in politics, were shy about the faith because they were educated in a closed-in environment where the priest is the only one that has the word and the lead, and laity has to obey and be silent and not give the opinion even. And that's the way that a few generations grew up, and it's going to take a while until everybody wakes up Protestants don't have that problem because they don't have clergy, you know. They have pastors, you know, and, and some have clergy like the Lutherans and Anglicans, but 
it's a very different church, you know. And they learn how to lead, and the, the Catholics yeah. didn't have that. They all learn how to lead, and they become missionaries, and they send them in groups, uh, and we lost this in the church. It's coming back, but a little too late and a little too slow for the pace of the world. And especially in the 20th century, it's coming with uh, uh, waves and uh, um, renewals that come from the lay people. Uh, yeah, like charismatic like renewals. Day, charismatic yes. Renewal and yes, many communities like that. Yes. The neo catechumenals. Yeah, yes. Uh, good communities, powerful communities, and I'm sure more are coming uh, because the traditional religious orders are disappearing, many of them, and in many countries. And uh, so a new wave of Catholicism is coming and it's from the laity. Yes. yes. So, so you think that what, what uh, was previously done by uh, 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 traditional orders like uh, Benedictines and Franciscans and all the rest that uh, kept and preserved the Catholic faith and were the ones that were evangelizing, you think that this role is now becoming the role of the lay people? Yes, we're still going to have very good religious communities, yes, yes, especially cloister, right? Uh, because they last forever, they are the, the stronghold of the church cloister nuns, cloister monks. Uh, but uh, regular religious communities are probably uh, disappearing massively with time. And late it takes over the missions, you know. Lay communities. We have a lay community, our community. And sometimes we are more strict than monks, you know. But we don't do it with rules. We just do it personal commitment with God, you know, and that's our seal. And if we look at it closely, it's looking at communities we know, religious communities, they have a lot to learn from us, you know, because they are just, they took the wrong roads, and many of them did. They are new age, they are hooked to the news and hooked to the internet and drowned into the world, and, and, and they are religious communities, and we don't do that. It's not because we are holier than them, but naturally, you know, we are inclined to be of God and, and we don't touch a lot of things that we know we shouldn't, you know? So yes. Yes. Uh, one more topic that I would like to uh, touch with you, and it just come up now. Two years ago, I was in Rome and uh, we had a leadership formation for uh, Catholic Charismatic Renewal. And uh, one of the topics that they, um, that they introduced and they said that uh, one of the biggest uh, concerns that uh, Pope Francis has is uh, how to raise up new generations of priests in Catholic Church. Because without priests we don't have Eucharist, we don't have uh, the sacraments and everything that we need to, and to live really healthy uh, spiritual life as Catholics. Um, what would you... Uh, uh, say about it and uh, maybe how to uh, what to say to the uh, lay people uh, to the youth that is uh, thinking about the spiritual vocation uh, what kind of a formation and uh, where to start with uh, with that um, I think that basically the church has very holy and perfect uh, formation uh, traditionally, you know, that comes from the fathers of the church, the old um, uh, monastic rules of St. John Climacos and Benedict, and, and those still work really well, you know. What we need to know, what we need to do is we need to go back to the basis of discipline, a spiritual discipline. And anyone that wants to be a priest, anyone that wants to be a monk or, or, a, or a missionary, they should know how strict that should be, you know, and the high discipline that one needs. And uh, that's what needs to be re re rescued, because that has been lost. Yes. Um, and last question. Uh, we talked about a lot, of, a lot about the situation regarding COVID and everything that 
is going on with all these ideologies that are attacking the uh, the faith and the uh, ones that are in faith. What would be your uh, uh, what would be your advice to the people that are watching us? Uh, how to preserve and how to uh, stay uh, firm enough in, in faith and in, in living the life uh, of a believer? Um, I will give you a personal recommendation of what I do. I make sure I keep a prayer life. The first thing I do when I open my eyes is I praise God for the gift of life. I praise God for my health, physical, mental, and spiritual, and I get out of bed and I offer the day to God. And to me, that is very important because then you live within God and for God. And then uh, you need to have a sacramental life that is perseverant and is steady. You know, you need to go to confession often. You need to look for the Eucharist, the strength, the power. You need to um, have a very good relation in your heart with the church. You know, you cannot be fooled by the humanness of the church. You cannot be disappointed or disheartened because of the priest or because of the pope or because of the bishop. You have to be focusing on God and you have to be Christ-centered, you know, very important. The other aspect that I keep very important for me is my relationship with Our Lady, the Virgin Mary. I, I keep her in my heart. I offer my love to her always and the Rosary has been also a great union with her. And uh, so I pray it every day, and I think it's a very important weapon. I have seen it work against the devil in an amazing way, and that's why I use it all the time and recommend it all the time. The other part is are aspects of our religion that are powerful and recommendable, uh, which is, for example, the power of the stations of the cross, the power of pilgrimage, you know, go, make an effort to go on a pilgrimage, you know, and to take the step, you know, it's important because there are graces, there are many things happening. You can see in the scriptures, uh, the Holy Family of Nazareth in a pilgrimage, you know, and, and you see that happening throughout his sacred history. And it's not an accident, it's something that comes from the Holy Spirit. So, and the other is to be a good person, you know, to make sure you have good deeds, good intentions, and you are always working to change your heart for the better. And I, I, I promise this is the last one. No, uh, I remember the last time you were talking, uh, you talked about the uh, <laughs> guardian angels. Um, what are your experiences during your uh, missionary work and uh, all your trips that you take? What are your experiences and um, maybe something that is what, what was revealed from the Lord to you? Uh, about the power and uh, the protection that they uh, give us? Um, what I learned is that our guardian angel uh, has as much power as we give him. Same thing with Satan, you know. Satan though has no power. He has as much power as we give him through sin. So we give power to our guardian angel through faithfulness. The more faithful we are to God, the good that we are, the strong, stronger the angel because he can do more for us. So it's very important to understand that a guardian angel is a guardian of goodness, is a guardian of peace, a guardian of success, a guardian of victory. He's the one taking us home. And so he deals with victory, he deals with goodness, he deals with everything that is the, the light. So if we move towards the light all the time, and if we look for goodness, we, our guardian angel is the most amazing power. Yes. Thank you. And maybe your last message to the people that, are, that will be watching us. Well, I, I have a message which I hold dearly in my heart. And it is, because all of what the Lord has revealed to me, to a, a miserable sinner like me, uh, 
because of all what I have seen. I only have one reason to be a missionary, and it is I don't want anyone to go down, you know, to condemn, because I have seen it with my own eyes. And I want to always remind people, I know you've been told in church that hell does exist. I know you've been told Satan does exist. And I know you've been told you're going to be before Jesus on a personal trial. And I know you've been told that it's going to be a last judgment for all creatures. And there is a heaven and a purgatory. But one thing is important. If we focus on our destination and we put our eyes in that horizon, we need to know for that we need to be holy. Uh, only holiness takes us home. And people forget about that. And it's possible to be holy. Absolutely possible. Because God will support us. If you decide that, your angel will be the happiest angel because that is the only thing he's expecting from you, to be holy. You know, so we need to be holy. Mr. Estrepo, thank you very much for your time and uh, for everything that you said to us. I hope this is not the last time we see each other. It wasn't first, but I hope it won't be last. Thank you very much for, You're welcome. for everything that you do.